Hello and welcome back Silicon Valley M&A Provisors Affinity Group and our speaker here today is Robert Houston. He is of counsel uh, at BPM LLP. He's going to talk to us about uh, rollovers and M&A transactions, in particular the tax side of that. So with that, Robert, I'm going to go ahead and turn it over to you. Okay, I'm trying to get, is my screen, is it, is it sharing? Yes, it is. Okay, great. So I'm, I'm trying to get this main screen back larger. I don't know if I can do that. I guess I can't. Okay, I can see Roger and a few others. That's fine. Yeah. So um, thanks for inviting me. I, I, as a way of background, I'm a former, <clears throat> former Provisors member. I was um, part of the initial founding group of Walnut Creek 2, um, and I was part of the founding group with Amy Cole and Walnut Creek uh, East Bay m and Affinity Group. Um, I left Provisors, I guess, almost coming up on three years when uh, I hit the age limit for partners at, at BPM <clears throat> and, and you have to retire. So Janice Gaskin took my role as host of Walnut Creek 2 as they consolidated uh, three Walnut Creek Provisors into two. So I, I'm very familiar with Provisors. Um, I came back the next day after retiring at BPM as an employee to continue leading the M&A practice uh, that I had started about 10 years earlier. Um, and I also came back to build a national tax team like a lot of the big four and a lot of national firms have a group of experts for tax uh, research in their firms. Uh, we created something similar for BPM except we're about eight people and not you know, uh, 500 or a thousand people. So a much smaller scale. Um, so if, if that's if that's helpful. Um, my full-time day job is M&A um, tax. We do a variety of transactions for you know public companies, reverse mergers down to private companies, down to deals is you know down to about the four to ten million dollar range, up to about a, our largest deals. We've done a couple just over a billion dollars, and we just closed one recently. Um, and so we, we do a lot of a lot of due diligence, buy side, sell side uh, support. We do a lot of structuring work. And one of the things that's been coming up a lot, as Roger mentioned, is, is rollover transactions. Um, we see it a lot with PE firms. They like to see the original founders stay in. Um, and we also see it with strategic buyers who want to keep the founders around for some period of time. Um, so we're going to talk about, you know, uh, equity rollovers, um, M&A transactions, and the various things that we, um, we, we encounter. So it's kind of a review. Um, and hopefully you've seen these type of structures. Um, I've worked with a, a number of folks on the call. I look through and I, I know a lot of you um, from past either uh, working together or just knowing each other professionally. And so let's see if I can make this work. How do I get to the um, scroll? There we go. So the kind of the agenda here and some stuff will go through quickly um, and some will slow down. And please feel free to jump in, ask questions. So we're talking about our objectives, you know, deal objectives. We're talking about basic tax consequences, you know, kind of middle market acquisition transactions, requirements for stepped up basis to the purchaser, requirements for taxi rollover to sellers, um, structuring opportunities to kind of get both buyer and seller in sync, um, and maybe some examples. So does that sound good? Yes, it does. All right, here we go. Um, deal objectives. I mean, buyers have a lot of object objectives, obviously, to get the company, get acquire control. They want to maximize their after-tax returns. Um, they would like to get stepped up basis if they can, so they can get increased, you know, deductions for their purchase price. Um, they'd like to minimize complexities and, 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 you know, impediments to the, to resale. Um, they'd like to preserve historical licenses without assuming tax contingencies. And they'd like to preserve and provide economic incentives to existing management. In other words, keep them around. Um, sellers' objectives, um, achieve liquidity event. Um, we see this often, especially today with this mass amount of baby boomers, my generation, that are exiting their companies. And, and then they end up going to Gil Barrett or somebody like that who needs to invest all that money after they sell it. Um, so they want as much as they can to be able to afford, you know, um, you know, you know, Gil's fees. So, um, you know, so, so they, want to, they want to get as much as they can after tax proceeds. They'd like one level of tax if they can. 
And then on the deferral piece, uh, they'd like a deferral on the rollover equity if there is one. Um, and potentially to retain participation of post-transaction appreciation, that proverbial second bite of the apple. Um, that's a lot of times why they'll hang around and you know go into a rollover transaction. Um, basic consequences, uh, sale of flow through entities first, uh, sale of partnerships, branches, disregarded entities, uh, transparent or flow through entities for tax purposes. Uh, the buyer may you know, buy ownership interests or assets. Um, purchase price is treated as paid for assets, uh, stepped up basis, you know, increases for depreciation, amortization, you know, goodwill assets, section 197, um, and it allows them to have deductions um, to shelter those cash flows. Um, so you know, buyers, buyers, if they can, again, they want that stepped up basis. Um, Sellers, they want to, you know, they sell assets to ownership interests in the entity. Our sellers realize capital gain on assets, except certain items that are taxed at ordinary rates. Um, this is your hot assets that you'll see in, in partnership structures um, and, and or 1245 recapture, um, 1250 recapture for depreciation and, you know, taken in the past. But again, the sellers would like one level of tax. They don't want to have tax inside an entity then tax out, you know, personally. Um, first kind of basic, con you know, concepts on C-Corps. Typically, if you're selling a C-Corp, you're selling stock. It's, normally, that's the type of transaction we see. Uh, sellers will sell the shares in the company and they realize capital gain on those shares if they've held them more than a year. That's your one level of tax. Um, buyer, you know, they buy shares, they obtain a cost basis in those shares, um, but th their share investment is not going to provide any any deductions of any kind. There's going to be no depreciation, amortization. Um, what they pay is going to produce, you know, basis in those shares. And then someday if they sell those shares, then they'll be able to realize that basis against a gain. We, everybody, any questions at this point? Is this kind of review? Um, we're okay? Okay. I think we um, are. All right. Um, again, C Corps continuing on. Um, sell C Corp assets. If a C corporation sells assets, then distributes after tax proceeds to its shareholders, we're now into this two level of tax realm, um, which is you don't want to be there um, because you're going to pay tax inside the corporation at federal rate of 21%. Um, and then you're going to do a liquidating distribution and they're going to get taxed at, you know, at, you know. 20%, I'm just talking about federal rates, you're still gonna have state income tax rate as well. Um, is an alternative for selling C-Corps and where the buyer wants to get some stepped up basis, there is personal goodwill transactions, um, which if you remember, we think about Martin's ice cream as it's a federal case. Um, we've done a number of personal goodwill transactions. Um, and this, the buyer gets capital gain treatment because they're buying the personal goodwill. Uh, the seller has zero basis, gets capital gain, but there's a series of, of qualifying attributes you need to be able to meet the Martin ice cream case to be able to do a personal goodwill transaction. So, um, so you ever get in a situation where buyer wants to get some sort of amortization, you have a C Corp, if you can meet all the rules of Martin ice cream, then uh, you may be able to do a personal goodwill transaction. Uh, very complex, a lot of valuation work uh, that needs to be done, but th that is an option. Um, buyer, you know, they, if they if they if they purchase assets, they get stepped up basis. Um, they get the value allocate to goodwill, going concern over you know a 15 year amortization. Um, generally, you don't inherit the C corp's historic and contingent liabilities when you buy assets as the buyer out of a C corp. Um, Honestly, in all these years, I've only had, I think, three C Corps selling assets um, because the cost, tax cost is so great to the seller. I had one, though, that's, it's worth mentioning. We had a, we had a tech client, chip maker uh, down in the down Silicon Valley, uh, public company buyer. Um, they came to a purchase price of, I think it was like $220 million. Buyer came back and said, we don't want to buy your corporation. We want to buy your assets. And the, and the seller said, okay, fine, but you have to gross us up. You got to pay, gross us up for the tax we're going to pay inside the corporation. And I was shocked they actually did it. So the sales price went from about 220 million to 300, and I think it was 325 million. 
and they, and they actually paid the tax gross up. That's rare. I hardly ever see that happen. Um, next next entity, we're talking about S corps. We see a lot of S corps, and I'm sure you do too. Um, S corps are very popular, um, and, and we have a lot of transactions going on with S corps. Um, seems we have three, two or three every month that we're helping. Um, S corps, you know, you know, you sell an S corp. Let um, me get back. I think I just went the wrong way. There we go. Um, sale of assets by S corps. You know, the buyer receives stepped up basis in the assets. Generally, only one level of tax is selling shareholders. Um, so this is a context. You have an S corp. Buyer shows up, and they just want to buy the assets. We see that often. Um, they don't want the corporation. They don't want the corporate contract. They just want to buy the assets. Um, generally, one level of tax is selling shareholders. Um, asset gains flow through um, and increase outside basis, limiting the second level of tax. Uh, gains will be taxed at ordinary rates for depreciable and, and, and cash basis S corps. This is again, you get into the 1245, 1250 recapture. If you're cash basis, you might have accounts receivable. You could have fair market value of your inventory. So that could create ordinary income. The rest would end up in some sort of section 197. Uh, amortizable asset for the buyer and give you cap gain for the seller. Um, one thing to consider is what we call the built-in gains tax. We have an S corp and selling assets. If they convert it from C to S within five years for federal and 10 years for California, um, you could have a corporate level C corp tax on the built-in gain. So you always want to make sure how old is that S corp election? Is it for federal greater than five if it's in California greater than 10? Um, stock sales of S corps, um, selling shareholders subject to one level of tax buyer has cost basis in the shares. They don't get any step up uh, in the assets. Um, we see this, but not very often. Usually it's some form of asset sale, which we'll talk about in a bit more. Um, so requirements of stepped up basis. Um, you know, asset basis steps that requires an asset purchase or constructive asset purchase. Uh, purchase of flow through entities such as partnerships, branch of discarded entities. Um, if you don't buy 100%, you can end up with a 754 step up. Um, and if it's an S corp, we can end up with a deemed asset purchase under section 338 or 336E. Um, these are elections that are made either jointly, like a 338H10 election, um, which we'll talk about in a bit, or a 336E with the selling shareholders to make the election. Um, asset purchase may be pretty expensive if the seller is a C corp um, it, without a large NOL to offset that's usable. So again, uh, there's interesting um, alternatives for getting stepped up basis. Um, uh, 338 requirements. Um, corporate buyer um, acquires 80% of vote and value of shares at least. Um, Share acquisition uh, obtained by purchase um, and non-taxable share contribution of tax-free reorganization. Uh, share acquisition must occur within 12 months. Um, buyer could elect 338G or a mutual election um, by buyer and seller under 338H10, which we see a lot of with S-Corps. See a lot of H10s transactions. But you have to be buying at least 80%. In most cases, you're going to buy 100%. Um, how, are most people familiar with the 338H10 transaction? Can't show a show of hands, but um, anyone want to chime in? I know we have a lot of attorneys in the I'm, audience. I'm, I'm guessing we are since we're all M&A people. Yeah, yeah. okay. But, but you might is. just point out that really it's it's a sale of stock for corporate purposes, but a sale of assets for tax purposes. Right. <laughs> at level. Yeah. 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 David Sullivan, you're going to say something. Yeah, I was going to say, will there be a discussion there or a touch upon F reorgs also? Yeah, yep, yep, yep. We're going to talk quite a bit about that. That's why I'm kind of talking fast now. Yeah, awesome. yeah. And Roger and I have done some H10 transactions together in the past, so um, I know he knows them. Um, so H10, you have to buy 100% of the stock. You need 80% of the shareholders approving. So you really can't do a tax-free rollover with a 338H10 transaction. And so this gets us into some other opportunities. Um, 
that David mentioned, which we'll be talking about in a little bit. Um, so the requirements for tax free rollover, generally all sellers will be taxed on cash received um, for the target entity. Uh, you know, compensatory shares will generate ordinary income with employees. This is something that comes up a lot. A lot of times sellers want to say, hey, great, we're selling this, but I want to give a bonus to our employees. Um, and you really have to really think through that and how you're going to record it um, because it needs to be on the, if you're a cruel basis, it needs to be accrued. Um, you got to talk to your buyer because, you know, how you can get the money into your old company. Uh, there's a lot of, a lot of steps you got to go through to make sure you're going to get the deduction if you're going to pay bonuses. Um, so just, just park that somewhere in your memory bank that if you're going to be paying uh, out bonuses to your employees and, there's a lot, there's a lot, quite a bit of extra planning to do around that to make sure it all happens the right way. Um, let's see if anything else I want to say here. Sellers either, you know, don't sell some or all um, of the shares, or they retain some or all of the equity, or they exchange old equity for new equity and tax free incorporation transaction, other deferral options. Um, flow throughs are interesting. You get into partnerships, you know, partners. 80% an example, partners, um, you know, they, they exchange 80% of the LLC member units for cash, and then they get 20% LLC units in the buyer's new LLC. So you can structure a tax free rollover for the 20%, and then you have an 80% sale of the assets for cash. A uh, buyer gets a stepped up basis. Uh, again, you, you will have 1245, 1250 and hot asset issues to worry about uh, with partnerships. Um, and the sellers will retain this rollover investment in this new partnership entity that the seller has created. Um, and it can get somewhat complex, but we see a lot of these uh, flow through entities, partnerships, sell of LLC member units and rollover e equity interests. A lot of PE firms like LLC structures. Um, so that's something that's very popular. Um, C corps very difficult to get a rollover and step up together. It's it's very difficult. That's probably all we need to say. Um, it doesn't happen very often. Okay, uh, unless unless there's going to be some sort of gross up transaction by the buyer. Um, again, there's going to be two levels of tax. Oftentimes, with stepped up basis with C corps, we've kind of already talked about that. Um, S corps. David, we're getting there, we're getting close. Um, so we have an S-Corp target and we can do our 338 H10 election. Um, this is your, your the election to treat a stock sale as an asset purchase. Uh, so it's that deemed asset sale. Buyer must acquire 80% by purchase all assets deemed sold. Um, S-Corporation's taxable gain allocated to selling shareholders are on a pro rata basis. Uh, seller seeking rollover will be subject to tax. You can't do a rollover, tax free rollover in an H10. Okay, it doesn't exist together. And that's why we talk about F reorgs. Uh, or F reorg has is, is been around for quite a while. I did a poll last time I, I spoke on it. And, uh, you know, some, some practitioners, uh, MA attorneys, been doing this since, the, since maybe the 80s. Um, we're seeing a resurgence of it in the last five years, a lot of F reorg structures. Um, and it gets confusing for, especially for sellers where they have small CPA advisors who haven't ever done an F reorg, maybe even, never even read the, the regulations. This comes across all the time. So we get brought in oftentimes to help um, so they can move the transaction through. So the thing about an F reorganization structure it preserves historic licenses, it um, buyer avoids tax contingencies from the sale and, and mitigates inheritance of historic tax contingencies. Um, so what is an F reorg? If you go read the, the code of the regulation, it, it's a, I'm, I'm kind of just paraphrase it. It's a mere change in place of organization or change of name. Or, or type of entity. So the most common F reorg that we're gonna see is, is kind of, a, it is spelled out in Rev Rule 0818. So if you, if you have read that, it's a good guide. There's a lot of white papers. You could go Google, you know, F reorg and an escort transaction, you'll find a hundred links. Um, almost every major law firm has an article about it. 
Um, so, so it's, it's very common. Um, but if you, if you don't do it right, you can, you can end up with a bad result. So what is an F reorg in an S-Corp transaction? Principally, what you're doing is you're forming sellers are going to form a brand new corporation. That's step one. And you give it a new name, whatever it is. Maybe it's the name of your old company with holding company in the name somewhere. And then the next step is, as the shareholders of record contribute and exchange the shares in the current S-Corp, we'll call it co into the new holding company. So now they own stock in the newly formed corporation and the, new, the newly formed corporation owns 100% of the S-Corp. That's your first, that's your first. Oh, and you also need to go get a new federal identification number for the new corporation. So you got to do an SS4 application um, by fax or on phone or, or mail. Um, you need a new EIN because the old S Corp through this F Corp, this uh, F reorg process keeps its federal identification number. Okay. So those are kind of your first three things you do. I don't have it as a step. The next step <clears throat> is the um, newly formed NUCO and the old S Corp make an S2 sub election, qualified sub chapter S election. Um, so what does that mean? Is when you make a Q sub election, the old S Corp is deemed to liquidate and dissolve into the new S Corp that was created. So it no longer exists for federal income tax purposes. But for administrative tax purpose, like excise tax, payroll tax, it still keeps its EIN and it's still a legal state entity um, that's out there. Um, and so that's your that's your your next step. You file Form 8869. Um, it'll take the IRS a bit to get back to you to say that they've received it. But you have to do your Q sub election. And then the next level is step four. You convert the old entity that you just Q subbed to a limited liability company at the Secretary of State. So now you went from theoretically a corporation and you convert it to LLC, but you only do this after the Q sub election has been filed. We typically wait three or four days before we do the LLC. So this is where you know, the, the attorneys are gonna go and convert that entity, okay? So now where are we? What do we have? We have our shareholders on top. We have a brand new corporation that holds 100% of the old S Corp that just got liquidated and dissolved. And one thing I didn't, I failed to mention on the form 8869, I think it's line 14, you check a box and you tell the IRS in that form that this is an F reorganization and here's the name of the new replacement entity and it's, it's new EIN. So you tell the government that we have an F reorg and the brand new entities, this name, this EIN owns hundred percent and the old entity is now being q -subbed. And then when you do your LLC conversion, you now have a single member LLC with all the assets and all the liabilities of the old S Corp. Does that make sense to this point? It does, but Robert, you might, you know, explain why we would want to go through all those steps and do that. Yeah, yeah. Well, there's a couple of reasons. One is you do this if you're going to have a rollover transaction. That's principally the first reason. As we said before, you can't do a tax-free rollover of seller's ownership into the new entity under 100% buy of the shares. That would be an after-tax rollover or with a 338H10, because you got to buy all the shares. So again, that would be an after-tax rollover. It's the only way we can do a rollover of equity into the buyer is with an S-Corp is using the f reorg rules. And it's another reason is, let's say during due diligence, you find out that it was, a, it was an invalid S election that was filed. The form 2553, didn't have a spouse signature on it. California community property state. Um, if you're married, both have to sign, husband and wife. Oftentimes they're not signed. And so the buyer's concerned about that or they can't find the 2553 or the letter from the IRS that it is a valid escort. Or perhaps maybe there's some 
things that came up on legal due diligence that people don't feel comfortable with. So oftentimes they'll do an EFRI org to get a new clean entity on top that's now an S corp then do the transactions. Um, so apparently it, it, it kind of cleans up past sins of the old S corp by doing an EFRI org. Right, because it's treated as an asset sale. That's so right. There's some problem with the uh, selection that stays at the NUCO level then. Correct, right. yep. So you, you, you separate yourself from any S-Corp issues. Now, the good thing is though, a lot of those issues the IRS has, have provided some recently, some um, uh, guidance with rev, rev, the student rev procs, I, I don't have them on top of my head. One is if you had invalid S-Election, you can go back and correct it and not, and, and not have any issues with losing your S-Status. And the other item that's been coming up, it's not my slides, it just, just really has come up recently. You maybe you've seen this. Oftentimes, when we start a new business, the, the, the entity of choice by many is an LLC. So we form an LLC, maybe in California. Um, we have a couple owners. We have a tax partnership. Um, and then at some point the, down the road, they say, gee, let's, let's be taxed as an S corporation. So they go and they, they do a check the box election, convert to corporation file form 2553, and now they're an S corporation. But they never update new articles in corporation. They continue to operate off their old LLC operating agreement, which oftentimes have different classes of LLC member units. They have different allocation models, whereas an S corp requires one class of stock and requires pro rata allocation. So oftentimes what we see as an, as an S Corp now, after being an LLC, having governing documents that are not in alignment with the single class of stock rules. So technically you're in violation of the S Corp single class of stock rules. And if the IRS were to come in, you don't have to make disproportionate distributions. You can just have governing documents that allow for it and you now violate the second class of stock rule. So there is a, a reverend procedure out there that you can correct it all and and what's great about it is you don't have to file with the irs at all you just need to go through all the procedures document it and they have out they have examples in the rev proc and how to do it and you correct all your governing documents so that means you would adopt articles of the corporation that would be for a corporation s corp single class of stock you would fix all those errors and you'd certify it and then you just keep it on record for 10 years and as long as you have it on record, the IRS shows up, you've solved your second class of stock problem. So I had to do a couple of those lately in some M&A transactions where it was discovered that they were operating off of uh, LLC documents that allowed for multiple types of levels of, of, of allocation, different classes of LLC units. So be aware of that as, as you're looking at transactions to make sure that if it was an LLC and they converted that they actually did the proper paperwork to get articles with one class of stock. Otherwise, this rev procedure will help you solve that. So that's just a little uh, sidebar here. Um, these these steps in the FRE orgs, um, it's outlined again in, in Rev Proc 08-18. Um, and it gives you examples um, and how you do it. Um, so it's something that you might want to um, take a look at. Um, is there anything else here? Buyer gets stepped up basis. Um, uh, seller gets one level of tax um, and they get a proportionate rollover opportunity where they, they roll over into the new entity. Now, what's another also important here is that new whole co S corp that just did a rollover transaction and received back membership units in a seller LLC is the owner of those. And that you don't, you, you, you can't, you're not going to liquidate that because then you would have, a 311B gain. So your, your new whole co S Corp is going to stay in existence, file tax returns, and um, hold on to that investment until there's an exit sometime in the future. Um, be careful if you were a C Corp before and you have C earnings and profits still in there because after three years, you have passive income, unless you're actively participating, you could lose your S status. So there's a few other things you got to keep in mind. So let's just stop there for a moment. Any questions on the F reorgs? War stories, experiences? No, I mean, you know, your point's well taken. I mean, there's a million ways to screw up an S election. 
Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, you know, not only that, I've had it several times. The H10 and those 336E elections, they're not they're not idiot proof either. I mean, I've no. seen plenty of those get messed up as well. And yep. the last time I went through, we had to pay user fees to fix it, which is. You know, uh, the law may have changed since then, but boy, no one likes to pay u- user fees to go fix a mistake. Yep, yep, so, yeah, absolutely. So, so I've been seeing this, and as people become more and more aware of how just technical and cookbook <laughs> these tax elections are, I've been seeing more of the FRA orcs. Yeah, be, be aware too, the, we, we haven't talked about state taxes. You know, what about sales, t- sales and use tax? Um, you know, we're transferring assets, we're making these deemed asset elections under the H-10 um, or the SAFRI org, you know, are we subject to sales or use tax or is the buyer? Oftentimes, you know, uh, you know, stock purchase agreements will say, well, buyer seller are going to split transaction costs 50-50. Usually that definition is, is sales or use tax. Um, just be aware that some states may want to try to get some use tax or sales tax on these transactions. Um, and it's hard to find in their statutes. Um, we just did one. We did an H10 in, in company based in New York with a with a with a, a factory site in New Jersey, and you can't find it in any of their rules. Um, but we were, I was actually able. I found a white paper article from a New York law firm. Turns out our head of state and local and our firm knows this guy personally, so we we're able to have a call. And he was actually able to provide us the authority that said in New Jersey, New York, there is no use tax or sales tax on a 338H10 transaction because you've bought the entity, but you had this, as Roger said, this fictional um, hypothetical deemed asset sale. So title hasn't transferred on the actual ownership of those assets. It's still under the same legal entity. So as a result, there's no sales or use tax. So a lot of states follow that, but boy, I tell you, going out and trying to find it in every state statutes are very difficult. So don't forget, you know, these kind of those kind of taxes can be significant. Um, so you might might want to, you know, put that in your checklist as well of things to, you know, make sure there's not exposure there. Probably the other big things that comes up, guys, in these transactions, you do due diligence and you find out that the, the company, the seller should have been filing in 40 states and not filing in, in three states. So not, and they should have been collecting sales tax because they're showing up and doing installation and repair and training. And all of a sudden you end up with a transaction where, you know, there's millions and millions of dollars of potential risk at this, you know, state level. Um, those are other things that, that you're gonna deal with um, in these kind of transactions. Um, you know, on it, you know, going through here, if we do these kind of uh, transactions and we, we we end up with an asset sale, um, either through the F reorg, um, because of twelve forty five recapture or the three H ten. One of the things we want to make sure we do, if, especially if we're representing the seller, uh, is to get a tax gross up on their ordinary income piece, um, because there's going to be ordinary income. If you just sold the stock, you pay capital gains, but now you're selling assets through these various um, elections. And now you're you're having ordinary income on the on the hot asset rules or 1245, 1250 recapture. Um, as a seller, you always want to make sure you, in your in your in your LOI uh, in in your agreement that the sellers are going to get grossed up for the additional tax. So on the ordinary income tax, and also if you're California-based S corp, it's the one half percent tax you're going to pay at the corporate level. So most sophisticated buyers all know about this, they, they, they're going to they're gonna agree. Because if you do a present value analysis of the benefit of being able to do an asset sale through H10 or through FREORG, and the buyer's going to get this 15-year asset, they get the write-off as compared to if they just bought stock. If you do the analysis, they're, they're way ahead tax-wise. So once you kind of demonstrate that, then the exercise is, well, what is the gross up? You know, let me let me just jump in here on one thing that's that's I guess relatively new, is that you know now we've got this 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 cool way of deducting state income taxes. Uh, oh, yeah, to, mm-hmm. to make the election, and that makes the case for an H ten even more compelling uh, yeah. to the seller. So it depends on which side you're on, but if the th- seller is saying, "Hey, you should gross me up," 
you know, because we're making the H10 and I'm not going to pay ordinary income rates on ordinary income items, buyer might say, yeah, but we're getting you a state tax deduction you wouldn't have gotten otherwise. Well, yeah, it's hard to do it in H10, though, because you've sold the corporation and the entity has to make the election. Right. Um, and so I guess you could do it in your final return, you know, but uh, we find in the F3 orgs, it works much better because you have an existing entity that's going to stay around to do the PTE election. Right. Um, but that's a planning point you do not want to miss. Because um, we, like I said, we just had a transaction that literally basis was, let's say, 80 million and proceeds was a billion four of an S corp in California. And we did an F reorg and they, and the buyer bought 100% of the LLC member units that popped out the other side of the F reorg. It wasn't a rollover transaction just for them. They didn't want any corporate history. So it was just easy to do the F reorg. And now we're doing the PTE election on that huge gain. So um, yeah, you always want to take a look at, can we do that PTE election um, in a lot of States? I think there's over 20 States that have PTE election similar um, some, some that the, the election in is, is so early in the year and you haven't even put your company up for sale, you may miss it. So but California is there. Um, so the other thing is, you know, you, you may have tax basis, um, assets that are different than book. You know, a lot of times we try to fix the sales price to tax book if you can, and have it in the actual allocation model within the purchase agreement. So you have arm's length buyer and seller agreeing to fixing price. That's another thing to think about. Um, also tax liabilities. Um, you know, a lot of times we see no cash, no debt, but they end up assuming AP and working liabilities. It gets baked into the networking capital peg. Um, but, you know, you have to take a look because there's certain liabilities for gap uh, that are not tax liabilities, like your allowance for bad debts, accrued warranty expense. Those are two examples. So you could have different bases, not only in your assets, but also in your liabilities. So that's something else you really want to, you know, track through and make sure you have a, you know, what your tax basis is and assets and liabilities when you do a transaction like this. So I think we've kind of come to the end of the slides. Any questions, comments, or? Well, that, my comment is that's why we need an accountant to review all this if you're going to do any of this. You know, I do want to point out one other kind of sleeper issue. And since the Tax Cuts and Jobs Act in 2017, we've got a new rule for, um, for self-created intangibles. It's not so much new as an expanded rule. And if you're doing these pass-through entities like S-Corps, it's a sleeper issue. Uh, but you could end up having more ordinary income on a sell side than you think. Yeah. And I've run into that uh, even with big four on the other side where I say, wait a minute, we've got a self-created intangible issue. Yeah. And I say, what are you talking about? Yeah. I said, go read the code. And, and Spidell's yeah. just last week came out. It, it's even worse than I had thought. Spidell's had an article last week. I don't know if you saw it, but on R&D expenses, which it's proposed that have to be... Um, uh, capitalized. And their point is that you have to capitalize and amortize over five years. And if you sell within that time, you got to recapture, but you don't get the benefit of the basis. Um, and there's, yeah. So there's there's some real kind of here in, in Silicon Valley where we sell technology. <laughs> That's what companies have. They have goodwill and they have technology, R&D. Yeah. Uh, you, you could, you know, there's some kind of sneaky counterintuitive tax issues at Baba. Right. Yeah. The, yeah, the requirement to capitalize section 174 um, is creating huge havoc um, in, in these kind of transactions. Yeah. 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 Okay. Any other questions from anybody? We're actually at the top of the hour here. Okay. If not, um, I am going to stop the recording. I want to thank you, Robert, for being here sure. and giving us that overview. Absolutely. Glad to join. Thank you, everyone. So